Hey everyone, I'm Craig and I'm here at Colonial Michelin Mackinac in Mackinac City. Now just about a year ago we put out a video about getting dressed as a British Grenadier. If you want to check that out I'd encourage you to follow the link so you can maybe get a sense of some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. But for whatever reason that video of me getting dressed as a British soldier in the 1770s became our most watched video ever. A lot of people watched it, a lot of people seemed to enjoy it, and a lot of people commented and left us questions. So today I'd like to just try and answer some of those questions. And keep that in mind. If you've got questions about some of the things I'm wearing, some of the things that I'm talking about, leave them in the comments and we might be able to get back to them. But let's jump right in and see what we can learn. So one of the things that a few people commented and asked questions about were grenades. I'm a British grenadier. This is their namesake weapon. Now, by the 1770s, grenades were perhaps not used as widely as they had been in earlier times, but they were still used in warfare, uh, especially in naval contexts. So you see sa sailors and marines using these things, uh, as well as by soldiers. If they were either attacking or defending fortified positions, they may have been tossing grenades. Now, the grenade is just a small sphere. It'd be full of gunpowder. It's got a fuse right there on the top. You would light that fuse using a burning piece of match stored in that match case. That was that brass thing that grenadiers would wear right there on their cartridge pouch strap. Once that fuse was lit, you could toss that grenade wherever it would need to go. That fuse would burn for a few seconds and then it would explode. Now, uh, although grenades were still being used in other places, we're pretty sure that there weren't any here at Michilimackinac in the 1770s. We have their ordnance returns from that time, so those are basically lists of all the different types of ordnance and ammunition that were in storage here. That's everything from cannonballs to explosive shells to musket flints, and even the paper that they were using to form musket cartridges. On those lists, there aren't any grenades. So even though the grenadiers of the 8th Regiment were here at Michilimackinac in the 1770s, they didn't have any hand grenades. But again, that doesn't mean that grenades were not still being used in other contexts. Another thing that a lot of people were commenting about was how complex this uniform appears to be, at least on the surface, and how long it might take to put one of these things on. Now, I actually timed myself as I was getting dressed this morning. It took me about six minutes to put all of this on, all told. In that video from last year, it took me about 16 minutes, but of course I was talking my way through that, so it was a little bit slower. Now, as you look at this uniform, again, it maybe looks ostentatious, it maybe looks very complex, but it's very much in keeping with men's fashions of the mid to late 18th century. If you remove some of the more militaristic elements of this uniform, particularly my accoutrements, so my cartridge pouch, my bayonet, you would have seen men wearing something relatively similar to this wherever you went. If you were encountering European men, whether they were in the American colonies, in Britain, somewhere on the continent, men would have been dressed in much the same way. Now, uh, there are some complexities to this uniform, I, I won't deny that. There's something like 44 buttons that I have to do to actually get this thing on, and that's by no means all of the buttons. I don't, for instance, button my waistcoat all the way up. You kind of leave that open at the top. When I take the breeches off, I usually don't unbutton all of the buttons down at the cuffs, uh, and so that does kind of speed things up. But as you look at this uniform, most of the buttons that you can see, especially here on my regimental coat, they are either non-functional or they're very rarely used. So I don't spend a lot of time buttoning all the buttons that you can see, but I do have to worry, for instance, about the five buttons that it takes to close up the waistband on my breeches, the eight buttons that I do actually bother to close on my waistcoat, and then in fact what takes the longest is buttoning up the spatter dashes, the half gaiters down at my ankles. Those are really what kind of takes the most amount of time. Uh, and uh, as, as time went on through the 1770s, you see some elements of the British military uh, actually adopting trousers that uh, incorporated elements of that gaiter, so they were very fitted around the ankle, uh, but they were basically a pair of pants, so you didn't have to do up those gaiters uh, separately. Now, uh, again, to us today in 2021, this might look ostentatious. It's bright red, it's got all these nice shiny buttons all over it, but again, it's very much in keeping with men's fashion of the time. So this would not have appeared all that out of place, at least in terms of the general silhouette and the general cut from what men were wearing really anywhere else. 
Well, of all the bits and pieces of this uniform that I demonstrated putting on in that other video and that I'm wearing here today, uh, nothing really generated as much interest as the neckwear. Now, in that other video, I was putting on a black horsehair stock. Uh, you can see that it's uh, it's just woven horsehair. It kind of looks like plastic, but it's not. It's a natural material. It's got leather ends and these brass clasps, so it's pretty quick and easy to put on. But this is just one option for British military neckwear. Uh, these things could have been made out of velvet. Uh, they could have uh, been lined uh, with a red fabric. They, some of them actually would have had little detachable collars that went over this to make it appear as if your shirt collar were just peeking up above. But what I'm actually wearing right now is another option. It's called a roller. And a roller is really just a strip of linen. It's about that long, and you wrap it around your neck a few times, tied in the front. And British soldiers probably would have had multiple rollers in addition to whatever else they would have been issued. Uh, it seems that they were issued one roller with every shirt that they had, and soldiers typically had somewhere between three and four shirts. Uh, and so they would have had multiple rollers. And it's there to just kind of dress up this look. People think that it's weird to put on this thing, people called this a dog collar, but really this neckwear is not too different than a modern tie. I know when I come to work most of the time, I'm not dressed like this, I'm wearing a tie. Uh, and it's the same sort of thing. It's just a bit of neckwear to kind of tighten up the silhouette around your throat uh, and make things just a little bit more formal. But again, back in the 18th century, there are multiple options for British military neckwear. Now, by far the most common questions and comments that we received on that previous video related to one of two things. One of which was, how do you go to the bathroom while wearing all of that? And the other was, are you hot wearing all of that? Do you smell while wearing all of that? Uh, there were also a lot of comments related to how sick the soldiers probably would have been. Uh, and so I'd like to take some time to address those because those all kind of relate back to ideas about health and hygiene in the 18th century and what the British military was doing to keep its soldiers clean and healthy. Because even though they didn't understand all of the science just yet that we understand today in the 21st century, they did know that dirty soldiers were typically unhealthy soldiers and unhealthy soldiers are ineffective. They can't fight. They can't do manual labor. They can't do any of the things that soldiers are expected to do. So officers, uh, medical uh, professionals, they spend a lot of time thinking about how to keep soldiers clean and healthy. Now, as to that first question, how difficult is it to use the bathroom while wearing all this? I can tell you from experience, it's not too hard. There's just a few buttons on the breeches there. There's a great big fly in the front. Uh, historically, there would have been uh, either chamber pots uh, within individual barracks rooms. Those would have been emptied pretty regularly. There were also necessaries or latrines. So we've reconstructed a military necessary right there behind me. Uh, and we can see in other places that those necessary houses would have been used for, you know, not a very long time. They would have been filled in and then the actual structure probably moved before too terribly long. So those latrine pits didn't become noxious and unhealthy. We know here at Mackinac that at one point the soldiers actually had to rebuild one of their necessary houses because it blew down in a storm in 1770. So they had to put it back up together uh, again. Now, in terms of the other question, are you hot in that? Do you smell? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, this is all pretty comfortable. As I mentioned earlier, I've got linen right there against my skin. On top of that, I've got wool. Those are all natural fibers. There's nothing synthetic in this. So uh, it's quite comfortable. And it is also just a matter of what you get used to. If you're used to wearing something every day, it's going to be comfortable. But then again, at a certain point, if it's really, really hot, if it's 100 degrees outside and it's really high humidity, you're going to be hot. It doesn't matter if I'm wearing this uniform or shorts and a t-shirt because that's not what I'm used to on a daily basis. So again, not terribly hot, uh, also not terribly smelly. And soldiers would probably not have smelled all that uh, 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 bad historically because they did put a lot of thought into keeping themselves clean. Now, that linen shirt that I mentioned earlier, that's a big part of it. 
That linen shirt serves not only as an undershirt, it also serves as underwear on my lower half, and that would have been changed pretty regularly. Soldiers were issued multiple shirts. They're part of the necessaries that every soldier would receive as many of as he needed. Uh, and uh, it seems that most soldiers had maybe three to five shirts, and they would have changed them maybe every day, maybe every other day. Uh, so they would generally have had clean linen against their skin. Those soiled linens would have then been washed regularly, either by the soldiers themselves uh, or by laundresses. Those are women who were attached to the army. Soldiers would have paid them directly to do their washing for them. So they were pretty much always in clean linen. Now, in terms of bathing and actually washing themselves, that becomes a little bit more difficult to ascertain. People didn't always necessarily leave the best records about how many times they took a bath or something like that. But we do know that people were keeping themselves clean, especially visible bits of skin. So if you can see skin on me right now, that would have been clean pretty much all the time. My hands, my face, the rest of my head, uh, those would have been washed regularly. There are some military authors who re specifically recommend installing towels in barracks rooms so the men can wash and clean their hands. There were also the expectation that men, not just in the military, but in wider Euro American society, there was the expectation that those men would be clean shaven essentially all the time. It would be very, very, very odd to come across someone uh, who had a beard or really uh, any, any significant growth of facial hair at this point in time in the 18th century. So they were shaving pretty regularly. They were also doing their hair regularly. Right now, I'm pretty inaccurate because I actually don't have a whole lot of hair. I shaved my head a while ago. Uh, that's not something you would have seen in the 18th century. There's a lot of thought in, in, uh, that's going into how soldiers should have been wearing their hair. Uh, at various times, they wore it long. There were all sorts of different orders as to how they were supposed to style that hair. Uh, there would be soldiers uh, who may have been a barber in civilian life, so they would know how to cut and dress hair. Again, other soldiers would pay them to do that for them. Here at Michelin Mackinac, we know at a certain point, uh, some of the soldiers, actually the grenadiers of the 8th Regiment, got upset because they weren't being paid enough and they couldn't buy flour with which to powder their hair. So they were doing their hair on a pretty regular basis here. Uh, again, all of that lends itself to keeping oneself clean. Now, in terms of full immersion, bathing, you know, taking a bath, jumping in the lake, something like that, again, not very clear. We see it happening pretty regularly on campaign. So even when soldiers are out in the field marching miles a day, fighting battles, they would still be bathing. Uh, and it kind of goes both ways. There are some instances where individual officers would basically order the soldiers to, to bathe in whatever body of water was nearby. There are a lot of other instances, though, uh, where officers would set aside specific times in which soldiers could bathe if they wanted to. They set aside those times so as not to offend uh, the civilian community nearby. Uh, and uh, it seems that soldiers in those instances had that opportunity on a pretty regular basis, maybe a few times a week, if not every day, they could have bathed themselves, again, in a full immersion uh, uh, kind of situation where you would actually strip down, jump in the water, uh, and use soap to actually clean yourself. So all in all, these soldiers really did think quite a bit about keeping themselves clean, maybe just in a little bit of a different fashion than we do today. They weren't maybe taking a shower every day, but they were using other methods and taking other steps to keep themselves clean and healthy on a regular basis. Now, the last thing that I'd like to address is a question that we get a whole lot here at Michelin Mackinac as we demonstrate muskets and some of the other weapons that British soldiers would have been trained to use back in the 1770s. Uh, and that relates to the tactics that were being used uh, in combat on the battlefields of the American Revolution. Of course, the soldiers here at Michelin Mackinac uh, were lucky enough to not really experience those battles. Uh, there wasn't any action taking place here in northern Michigan but they were still taking part in a tactical evolution that was taking place in the 1770s. Uh, the British were applying lessons that they were learning in real time as they were fighting the American rebels. They were also applying lessons learned from fighting here in North America uh, 10, 15 years earlier during the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, uh, and their tactics were much more mobile. Uh, they relied much more on the use of cover than a lot of people imagined, so they wouldn't just stand there waiting to get shot. 
Uh, there's actually a command to tree that became relatively common as the war went on. That meant that the soldiers were ordered to find and take cover. If there was a tree there, they were supposed to stand behind it and shoot from behind that tree. Uh, and uh, they, in general, moved a whole lot faster on the battlefield than a lot of people imagine. Uh, again, the common, I think, stereotype today, especially in the United States, is that the British soldiers just kind of lumbered out onto the battlefield in these closely packed ranks, you know, physically touching shoulder to shoulder, and then they stood there uh, and basically just got mown down by American musket balls. That's generally not the case. That, that does happen occasionally, but it's generally not the case. They were much more adaptable. Uh, they moved a lot faster. They were much more willing to use and take cover whenever it was available. Uh, and that made them a pretty resilient fighting force. Uh, again, this is a huge topic that we could talk about for a very long time. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to recommend a book that talks at length about this. It's called With Zeal and With Bayonets Only by Matthew Spring. Uh, and he specifically looks at tactical advancements on the battlefields of the American Revolution, what the British were doing to attempt to uh, continue to maintain a presence here in North America. Now, uh, again, that's just kind of a, a quick run through of some of the more common questions and comments that we got uh, on this Dressing a Grenadier video. I hope you found this informative. Once again, if you do have additional comments or questions, please leave them below and maybe we'll do this again. We can try and answer some more of your questions. Now, if you like videos like this or if you like visiting our sites like Colonial Michelin Mackinac here in Mackinac City, I'd invite you to come visit. We are opening for the 2021 season uh, on May 5th here at Michelin Mackinac. If you'd like more information about coming to visit the fort or if you'd like to buy some tickets, you can visit our website, MackinawParks.com. And in general, again, if you like things like this, I'd uh, uh, urge you to consider uh, either becoming a member or making a donation to Mackinaw Associates. That's the friends group who funds a lot of the activities that we carry out, not just here at Colonial Michelin Mackinac, but throughout the Mackinaw State Historic Parks family of museums in historic sites. So again, consider uh, maybe making a donation to Mackinac Associates because they really do help us out. Now with that, uh, again, hopefully this has been informative and do also hope to see you here at Michelin Mackinac sometime this summer. <laughs>